invite our sister Rachel on up. She's going to share work. tonight uh, what God has been doing in her life over the last three months as we've been talking about being reconciled to ourselves, okay? As people are coming in, just scoot on over, put your bag on the floor. It's dirty, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> and, yeah. All right. Ready? Yay! Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rachel. I'm Rachel, for those of you who don't know me, and I started coming here, I think, in January, and really that's when the whole process of being reconciled to God and myself really began, just step, stepping foot in this wonderful place, and I'm so thankful for all of you who have made me feel so accepted and loved, and so I'm very blessed by all of you, so I wanted to say that first. Um, but one of the main things that um, God has really been showing me is just my struggle with comparison. And yeah, we can do it, you know, physical comparison, but I really struggle with comparing myself to people who are wiser and older in their spiritual life. And so, yes, it's okay for us to look at those people and admire them and admire the characteristics and the way that God has worked in their lives. But when I, I tend to um, compare my chapter 5 to their chapter 20, mm. and then I beat myself up that I'm not there. Wow. And mm. so um, there are a few things um, that God has really showed me um, with that. And the first main thing um, is that when I'm comparing myself, I am um, robbing myself of the joy I find in my own relationship with Christ. Amen. And as well as the joy I find in, in being myself, being the woman that God created That's me to right. be, yeah. I, I losing that joy because I'm looking to other people saying, oh, I want that. I wish I was that right now. Yeah. And so that's that's one of the main things, just missing out on the joy that God right. has for me right now. And the second thing is um, when I compare myself, I am rejecting God's will for my life. Wow. And I'm saying, I would rather have that person's life and your will for their life wow. than your will for my life. Because it looks, it looks better or easier or more adventurous. Something, wow. it looks like they're serving God more. And that's what I tend, I tend to do. I look at people and I say, oh, they're serving God more. They must love God more than I do. Instead of taking that time to really reflect in my own heart and say, well, what can I do to be in your will, God? And to get to my chapter 20, yeah. what can I do now? So the third thing um, that you've been showing me is that I am increasing an unnecessary fear of not being good enough, wow. which then fuels even more comparison. Wow. And um, I, we, we compare ourselves out of fear, I feel like. And then again, that it brings in more fear when we are comparing ourselves You're right. because we're not... Um, we're just not looking into ourselves. We're looking at other people and saying, I'm not them, I'm not them, they're not me, they have it better than me, or, or whatever it is. And that that just like weighs down our heart and our soul, and it just brings in this fear that is just not necessary. Um, and then the last um, major thing is that um, when I sit back and compare myself to someone else's life or my heart to, the, to my view of their heart, um, I am wasting time, the precious time that God has given me mm -hmm. to be fully um, who he has called me to be wow. and to step into the places that he has called Die. me. He is calling me deeper into myself yes. and his will. And if I am wasting time wishing that I was as loving or as compassionate as, um, as, a, as a woman of God that I see um, and just wasting that time saying, oh, I wish I was that way, then I'm not working on my heart yeah. and I'm just wasting that time. I don't want to waste my time anymore. So he's just showing me that I don't have to compare myself anymore. That I can be in the moment and be who he has called me to be. Because he's calling me to be bold. And he's calling me to love others and serve others. And um, just have compassion and just, just the boldness. He's yeah. calling me into that boldness. And uh, this is so different for me. I don't speak in front of people. Well, you do so this, now. This, 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 this is me, this is me stepping into his will for my life. And so I think that was a really cool thing that just being asked to come up here. And, um, I have one thing I was going to. Um, 
Um, I was going, so last, the last Sabbath Saturday, um, I wrote the poem that Jessica Mass um, sent out the little um, format for um, the poem to write about uh, where I'm from. So I'm just going to read you mine, just, just because I felt like that would be a good ending. <laughs> so, um, I am from the Candle of Grace, from Herbal Essences and Ovaltine. I am from a place of neutral warmth, comfort, home, built so uniquely, a one of a kind, with every room holding memories of my dear childhood. They are dense and sweet, the way freshly baked brownies are, chocolate chip cookies, fire alarms ringing so loudly, the hose by the garage flows with chilly water as it washes away the mud caked to our bodies. Peace and joy, love is thick in this home. It is anything but empty and broken. It is full. It is where love and grace rest. I am from the sunshine, the oleanders, olive tree, whose long gone limbs I remember as if they were my own, stretching out to hold the young and the innocent, those with no cares, those with pure joy, smiles and laughter that sing with the birds. I am from the dinners at a small table and loyalty, from Jeff and Nina, Aww. and leaving dirty dishes to stack high when the dishwasher is empty, <laughs> eating boxes and newly bought popsicles, and scattered socks in the living room. I am from the miscommunication uh, and laughter that rises from deep within, from go to your room, and I love you to the moon and back. I am from, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. Opening one gift on Christmas Eve and setting out cookies and milk for Santa. I am from Clovis and a heritage spanning across Europe. Mom's delicious soup and grilled cheese sandwiches. From time to pretending to be asleep. My father kissing my forehead and my mom's beautiful voice resonating within the walls of our home. Sleeping under the stars in the hot summer heat building fairy homes, making special potions, and mud. Oh, all of the mud. I am from a home of grace and love, with expectations to be the best I can be, not, perfect, not perfection. I am a dancer with joy in her heart, right. and light in her smile, quiet, listening, longing to follow Jesus. I am Rachel Lee Kenny, only me on earth. Wow. <laughs> Wow. Wow. Um, this is your first time up here. It won't be your last time. So um, thank you, Rachel, for sharing from your heart tonight. And I don't know about you all, but this is like just the beginning of what God is stirring up inside of each of us and what he's doing in our lives. And if you don't have one of these or one of these, like, I'll, I'll, I'll get you one. I'll get you. We, you've got to take note of what God is doing in your life. So you may not be up here six months from now, but somebody is going to be in your life and you're going to be able to look back and say, oh yeah, back in 2014, let me tell you what God did for me. And you're going to have record of it. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Before we um, invite our sister Marsha up to just lead us in a precious time of praise and worship, I, we, I just want to pray for our sister. So a few of you all can just, um, just where you are, you can just pray for her, and I'll close this out. Um, and just everybody, if you could just stretch your hands towards our sister, that the work that yes. God has begun, <laughs> he will perform it, he will perform it. It will be complete until the day of Jesus Christ. The good work that has been started. Mm. Y'all good pray. Wow. Thank you, Lord. No eye has seen, Rachel. <laughs> no ear has heard. Neither has it entered into your heart, Rachel, the things that God has in store for you. The things that he has in store for you, Rachel. Wow. Thank you so much for what you do, Rachel. God, that she is faithful, Lord, that she is aware of all this that you're doing, that she's able to share it with us, Lord. Thank you so much for her testimony, for your testimony in her, God. Thank you. 
for um, allowing her just to be so bold and to to step out in faith and to um, just to be more confident who you made her. So just continue to bless her as she mm-hmm. says yes to you and she yes. pushes into your will and just wants to find that more and be with her, bless her, and support to see Father, we exalt you, we praise you that you assign you. Yeah. The purpose is the reason why she is here at this particular moment in time. Yes. That it is not by an accident. No. That as she continues to search you out, that you are drawing closer and closer to her. Mm-hmm. And that you are unveiling who she is to her mm-hmm. more and more and more and more. And that as you are taking her by the hand and leading her, she discovers and her eyes are open to what she is and who she is Mm -hmm. and the assignment that you've given her. Mm -hmm. She understands and she knows and she walks, Lord God, with her eyes focused on you Mm -hmm. as she runs this race, that she's touching lives unknowingly and knowingly, touching Mm -hmm. lives, causing waves of action and reaction, Mm -hmm. causing the burst of your love to go forth Mm -hmm. as she moves in your grace. We thank you, Father. And as Rachel carries the namesake of Rachel in the Bible, God, mm-hmm. we thank you, God, that Rachel carries favor within her womb. Mm-hmm. We ask in the name of Jesus that this Rachel here on this earth at this time, at such a time as this, that she will carry favor wherever she goes in the name of Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So this is what the Lord is saying to you, Rachel, in Isaiah 54 and 10. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. So God, we thank you for our sister Rachel. Thank you for who you've created her to be and how every day she is drawing closer and closer to you. God, thank you that her pursuit of you is in direct correlation with your pursuit of her. She is responding to your call by drawing nearer and nearer to you. God, bless her. Continue to bless her in mighty ways, God. Do more than what she thinks you're able to do. Show her more than what she's able to to take in take her places god beyond her wildest dreams god may she have encounters with people and may those people be just drawn to you because of the light that she carries thank you god for our sister rachel and father we just dedicate this night to you god thank you that you are already here thank you that your presence is already here god Thank you that you are already here. Thank you, God, that you are already here. You are so close, God. Thank you that you will never leave us. You will never forsake us, God. But you are right here. And as the word was spoken last week, full access granted, God, we declare it again tonight. Full access granted. That is, if there is anybody in this room tonight who needs anything from you, God, who needs anything from you, God. May they be drawn closer to you because you are our everything. You are our everything. So God, we give you this night. We give you this time. Father, we give you our lives in a fresh way. Father, we submit to you. We surrender to you tonight, God, in a fresh way. Just as your grace and your mercies are new every day, so is our submission and our surrender to you new this night. Have your way in our lives. Have your way among us tonight, God. Thank you for joy. Thank you for laughter. Thank you for peace. Thank you for hope, God. And thank you that you are here. Thank you for your power. That your power is everlasting. Thank you for tonight, Jesus. We love you tonight. And we thank you for who you are in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Please.
<laughs> We're just being obedient to the Lord's um, leading tonight. <laughs> These two young ladies are, are gifted in dance and so ritual. So God is just calling out, stirring up that gift in you. We talk about boldness. So um, you know, be able to God calling you guys up as you touch feet and pray over you that the gift will be stirred up in you, that you will be free to worship and dance. Amen. Never Amen. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for the gift that is in Rachel, Lord. I thank you that she has, you have revealed to her the boldness that needs to come yes. from her, God. So I pray that as she ministers to emotion, God, that you would move through her. Yes. You would move through her limbs, God. That it won't be her, God. That she won't be afraid any longer. That she won't, again, compare herself to other dancers, God, because you've given her a specific dance. Yes, God. Yes. So I pray that, God, you would release the gift yes, in her. Yeah. Yeah. That, Father God, that she would worship you, yeah. Father God, with yeah. no restriction. Yes. Yeah. In the name of Jesus, I pray that the anointing that flows through Kristen and through Kim and Janelle and any other dancer in this room, that that would be transferred, Father God. Yeah. And that um, she would just dance, Father God. Mm -hmm. Unto you, God. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Unrestricted. Thank you, Lord. Unrestricted. Yes. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Yes. No more fear. Thank you, Lord. No yes. fear. Thank you, Lord. And not inadequate. Oh. <laughs> Hallelujah. He has gifted you. Yes, so I pray that you would just move yes. as yes. he instructs you. Yes. In Jesus' name. Yes. Thank you. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, Lord God.
price for me. You paid the price for me. Way back on Calvary. Way back on Calvary. Yes, I praise, yes, I praise you. I lift you up. I lift you up. I magnify your name. I praise you. I praise you. Because God is here. And, um, and so I'm excited about what's in front of us. Um, we're going to, tonight is our impact gathering. So for those of you that are not familiar with On Ramps as a church, every Saturday we do something different. The structure, the shape of our gatherings are different every Saturday. And so this Saturday, as is always true of the third Saturday, is our impact gathering. What that means is that uh, we are intentionally engaging our world, our neighborhood, our community. It is a shame, I think it's a shame, that if we were to gather here every single Saturday evening like we do, and the only thing our community would know about our church and about our gathering, the place where people who follow Jesus and, lo and say we love God, is that we just take up all the parking spaces. If that's the only thing that our community knows about our, about the church gathering, I think that's a shame. And Amen. so uh, and so every Saturday, we just make sure to look, because I know that you all are doing so much every day of every week and are impacting this community and this city in significant ways, in the ways in which God's called you. I know there are people here who are involved in the jails, I know there are teachers. I know there are people here who are involved in law enforcement. There are people who are uh, walking the streets every day. And when you walk the streets, you pray for people. Everything that you are doing is impacting this community in significant ways. But together on the third Saturdays, we pause and we say, let us together then become engaged in some way in this community and in this world that is going to ultimately usher in God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Does that Amen. sound good to you? Amen. All right. And so so that's what we're doing tonight. Okay. So that's why on the back it says today is impact. Okay. So that's what that is. Next Saturday is the covenant gown. And uh, you'll have to come next Saturday to see what that means. Um, uh, we're going to be at Dickey Park next Saturday. So, so make sure you know that. Okay. And so the fourth Saturday. All right. So if you come, uh, don't come here. Okay. We love this building, but we won't be here. We'll be at Dickey Park. Y'all know where Dickey Park is? Amen. Okay, right? I mean, like a block from here. Okay, it's it's on Blackstone Divisadero. And uh, what's up? Thank you. Right in the back of here, just walk down there and Dickey Park right there. Spoken by somebody who knows exactly how to get there. That's all. Awesome. Thank you. All right? And so, uh, at what time will we be over there? Six. Six. What time are we here? Six o'clock. Six o'clock, six o'clock. Okay? So that's what we're doing. Um, all right, so next Saturday we'll be over there. Uh, tonight is an exciting night. Um, I, we are, this is, uh, we are, as Marcia said, okay, we are in the middle of this, actually we're at the end of the series. Next week will be the end of it. Uh, and we are, uh, been talking about being reconciled to ourselves, just quickly in terms of context, okay? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis chapter 1, okay? All right? And then, He creates humanity, all right? And he creates us in his likeness and in his image. That's what Genesis 1 and 27 says. 
And then Genesis chapter 3 comes, okay? So when you get a hold of a Bible, you can read these verses, okay? And so Genesis chapter 3 happens, and that is where evil enters the world. How do you know it? Do y'all know about evil? Have y'all yeah. seen evil in our world? Yes. Have you experienced evil in our world? Yes. Absolutely. Evil entered the world. How did it enter the world? It entered through us, okay? We partnered with Satan. We partnered with him. We held hands with him. Come on, okay? Pastor. All right? And, and, and we said, yes, uh, we are going to do what God said not to do. That, that's, that's quickly how, how evil entered the world, okay? We said, we say, we said, we will do what God told us not to do. So what happened then is this. There are four relationships in our world that completely got distorted because of that. Number one, our relationship with God was fractured and distorted. That's why people don't even know who God is anymore, okay? We don't know Him. And when we talk about Him, we talk about crazy stuff. But that's not even Him, okay? All right? Because it's messed up. And so and so we say all kinds of stuff about God. We say God hates us. That's not God. God loves us. Amen. That's because we don't know Him. Okay? Our relationship with Him is messed up. And so you got to know Him. You know that God loves us. Okay? Our second relationship that got messed up is our relationship with ourselves. Like me. Like I don't know me anymore. Okay? So we talked about this building space. And for those of you that, that have eyes to see, you can see that right about here there was a wall. Okay, we tore this wall down about a month ago, all right? And so what we've learned about this wall as we tore it down is that apparently Youth for Christ tells us, for those that have been around long enough to know this, all right, they tell us that as we were tearing down this wall, they said, oh, you're tearing down a wall that actually didn't used to be here. And so what we've learned over time, right, is that uh, we are much like this room, that there is an original architect to this room. And the original architect did not design a wall to go here. Ah. But at some point in time, somebody came along and built a wall here. Okay? And then what happened is that basically if you came along at some later time, you had no idea that the original architect did not intend for a wall to be right here. So when we were tearing down this wall, we thought we were tearing down a wall that originally was here. And we thought that we were, that we were moving into uncharted territory. We thought this space right here was brand new space. What we learned though is actually we're entering into old space. And so it is with our lives. God, the Bible says in Psalm 139, He entered into the depths of the earth in the secret place and He formed us and He shaped us and He knit us together. But then sin entered the world and we began to build walls. Sin entered wall, began to build walls in our lives. And so many of us, this journey of being reconciled to ourselves is a journey that's very scary because we feel like we're entering into new territory. But what I want to encourage you about is this. I want you to know that the territory that you're entering into as you begin to tear down the walls of your life, that first of all, those walls were never intended to be there. Huh. Secondly, I want to say is that because you are journeying with God, the architect of your life, that as you tear down this wall, it's actually a safe journey. Because you're doing it with God, and you're entering into territory that God originally designed for you to enter into. Amen. You're supposed Amen. to look like this. You just didn't know it. Alright? And so, and so you and I now right, are being reconciled to ourselves. We're tearing down walls in our lives. And we're discovering that there's all kinds of square footage that you and I never knew existed in our own souls. Amen. Okay? All right, and so this is a great journey. And then the third relationship, Genesis chapter 3, was one in which we were, we were fractured between us and each other. Do you know, I don't know if you're paying attention to what's going on in Iraq right now, but yeah, that's war, okay? We don't like each other. Matter of fact, we will literally kill one another. I will take your life because I dislike you that much, okay? That's not the way in which God designed our world. Again, we talk about a God that we do not know. Okay? God didn't intend for there to be war in our world and did not intend for us to hurt one another. Did not intend for us to kill one another. That's not part of His original design. And so, that has been fractured. And that's going to be next quarter. We're going to start going into that territory. And last mm. but not least, we have been fractured in just chapter 3 between us and the rest of the earth. And we'll talk about the fourth quarter. Okay? So that's where we are. Last, uh, we've been leaning on this scripture, Acts 17 and 26. Acts 17 26 says that from one man, God created all people, all nations, mm -hmm. 
The word in the Greek is ethnos. That's where we derive the word, our word ethnicity from. So in the beginning, God from one man created all ethnic groups, all people groups, all of us. Diversity is part of God's plan. All right? Diversity is part of God's plan. He didn't intend for you to look like me and me to look like you. Okay? He created all ethnic groups. So we celebrate our ethnic heritage because our ethnicity is from God. And if it's from God, then it's good. All right? And so, so this has been the journey that we've been on, that we will be reconciled to ourselves this month through our ethnicity, through our ethnic heritage. And tonight we go a little bit deeper. Tonight, because it's Impact Gathering, we're going to do something really fun. So I'm going to give you a fair warning. We're going outside, but don't worry, we won't be out there that long. And I'm not going to make you do too much. Okay? So I'm just telling you, I know you all get freaked about doing stuff. So I don't want you to get all worried about it. I'm going to do a lot. Okay? So, but we're going to go outside. So uh, join me on this journey tonight and being reconciled to ourselves through our ethnicity. Are you ready to join me on this journey? Yeah. All right. So we're going out the back. All right? Join me out there. Let's go. So, so we just, we're not going to run the race, but here's what we're going to do. This is a journey of being reconciled to ourselves through our own ethnicity, okay? So here's the thing. Uh, this is a unique race because it's not exactly like what John just did, okay? We're not actually going to start shoulder to shoulder. We're going to actually, uh, I'm going to need you to respond to some questions that I'm going to ask you in just a minute. Uh, and then we're going to begin uh, to realign our starting position. So here we go. This is the first question. As we think about our ethnicity, okay? Our ethnicity is not just our race. I know we think about it like that, but that's not what we've been teaching here the last couple of weeks. Our ethnicity includes our beliefs, our customs, our traditions, our attitudes, okay? And so here we go. If we were to start this race right now, we'd have an even starting point, but watch what's about to happen. I want you to do this. If, when you were growing up, if when you were growing up, your parents helped you to do your homework and to study for tests, I want you right now to just take one step toward me. If you did not, if they did not, stay where you are, okay? Next question. If you had to have a job in high school to help pay the bills in your household, I want you to take one step backward. If you can go to just about any supermarket, any grocery store in the city and find, find food that is common to your tradition and ethnic heritage. You don't have to worry about it. Stop at the shop at the supermarket and you can get what you want. Just take a step forward toward me. If it's harder for you, you should stay where you were. Okay? If, if, you had a family member or a close friend who has been incarcerated in jail or prison, I want you to take a step backward. It's almost everybody. You know that's if, a statistic. If one of your parents was either partially or fully illiterate, couldn't read very well. I want you to take a step backward. If one or both of your parents were teenagers when you were born, I want you to take a step backward. If there were 50 or more books in your home growing up, I want you to take a step forward. If the things that your family loved to do for fun cost money growing up, like playing pool or going skiing or whatever, take a step forward. 
Yeah. If it costs it's money. Going to the beach. That's like half a step. Okay? Half a bit, half a bit. If your teachers and school principals growing up looked like you, take a step forward. Wait, say that again, sorry. If your teachers in school growing up looked like you, take a step forward. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> if your parents <laughs> if your parents owned a home while you were growing up, take a step forward. They own a home. Take a step forward. Okay? If you have ever traveled to another country, take a step forward. If you've ever traveled to another country, take a step forward. Does Canada count? Yes, it's another country. Even though we don't count Canada. Yes. <laughs> I was waiting for that. I know. Good. What? Mexico counts? It's another country. Yes. Okay. All right. If, if the people who repaired things for you. I'm getting personal. Growing up, like think think about your car or or plumbing or something that was broken in your home, okay? If they are the same gender as you, take a step forward toward me. So if it was a man and you're a man, take a step forward. If it was a woman and it was your woman, take a step forward, okay? Alright. If you were ever refused service anywhere. Because of the color of your skin, take a step backward. That's like a gun. <laughs> okay. If you have any, uh, let me say this one. Uh, if your favorite movie stars are of a different race than you, take a step backward. If your parents ever told you that you have to work harder than everybody else in order to get a fair chance in the world, in work, in school, or anywhere, take a step backward. If you ever heard that come out of your parents' mouth? If you, if your parents ever owned any stock in the stock market or ever had any investments of any kind, take a step forward. If there was a computer in your house growing up, take a step forward. If you had a car in high school, take a step forward. If you had your own savings account as a child, anywhere between the ages of 0 and 18, take a step forward. If you saw images in church growing up, that looks like you. Take a step forward. Yeah, that was a big no. <laughs> if you can make reservations at a restaurant or a hotel or anywhere like that and not have to wonder if people of your Heritage are welcome and treated well there. Take a step forward. Don't worry about it. Everything's fine. Okay, you're fine. All right, I just want to Just uh, stay where you are. And just look around a little bit. Just turn your head. Turn around if you want to a little bit. Just look around and make some observations. That's a great question. What happened to us? What So now, let me ask you. If this were a real race, Victoria, you okay have question? Okay. If this were a real race, and this were really how we were starting this race, I don't have a chance. I don't have a chance at all. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
I'm laughing. How would you feel if I were really in control of this race and there were real rewards to be won at the end of the race? I'm talking about significant awards. I mean, I mean, your whole life could maybe be dependent upon this race. And then I were to say right now, with everyone ready to run from this starting position, if I were to say, ready, set, go. What would you have been thinking based upon where you are standing before I fire the gun and start this race? Think about that. Actually acknowledge so many people that have been without a voice in our country for so long. Amen. Um, so I have the privilege of being a, a daughter of two cultures. I am an American woman, uh, but of Mexican roots. So I have been influenced both by um, United States culture, but also by my Mexican roots. And my family, my parents, they were both uh, teenagers when they came to this country illegally. And then when they got married, they became legal permanent residents and then um, raised my five brothers and I under a very traditional Mexican household. And just to share a little bit about that with you guys, what that looks like is, um, my boyfriend Kevin is here today. Kevin actually went to meet my family for um, Mother's Day. And so he came to the park, he met my brothers, he met my parents, and he also met over 60 of my cousins. <laughs> yeah. What are their names? Are they? <laughs> That's the real truth. He met some of their kids. Uh, he met over 20 of my aunts and uncles. And he met my grandparents. And he met my great grandma. And he still has to meet some of the ones that weren't able to be there that day. Wow. So, And he's here today, so I don't think I scared him off. Yet. <laughs> Um, and also in my upbringing, there was such a value in getting together to celebrate relationships and life through very loud and festive music, through an abundance of delicious food. And it didn't matter how late you got there, because as long as you were present when you were there, that's all we cared about. Christmas in our household consisted of about 100 people in the same small house and by the end of the night, there was enough wrapping paper probably to fill up this building. Wow. Um, but it was beautiful, and I embraced it, and I loved growing up, and that's my, that's my memories of my upbringing. Uh, but as I grew older, and my parents made it very clear that they were in this country to give us a better life, so that we wouldn't be standing in the same place as they were in that race, it made it very clear to me that um, higher education was an absolute must for my brothers and I. Um, so me being uh, daddy's only girl, I wanted to make him really proud. So I was exposed to the American or the outside culture. And then it became very apparent to me that when I was in the home or on a personal level, Mexican identity was my only identity. But as soon as I stepped out into the American world for the purpose of success, I was expected to turn that switch off, mm -hmm. remove my Mexican identity, and act as an American for the purpose of success. Um, and later on in life, this started to become more and more confusing for me as I started to figure out how can I navigate these two cultures, how can I coexist with these two cultures, and then just thinking about the I implicit messages that were sent to me as, as a child. Um, for example, my, when my brothers and I would speak English in the house, my dad would firmly tell us, in esta casa se habla solamente español. In this house, you only speak Spanish. On the flip side of that, I went to, um, I was in a bilingual class in kindergarten and first grade. And in second grade, I remember going home really excited because the vice principal came directly to my class to announce publicly that myself and another student were able to advance to the English only class because our um, grades showed a above average academic achievement. Mm -hmm. So I walked out really proudly out of that class and walked up that symbolic ladder and um, 
as I, as I saw my peers that stayed in that bilingual class all the way up until high school, I remember thinking that there was something inside of me that made me feel superior to them. Because for me, what that meant was that English translated to intelligence, mm -hmm. and Spanish translated to being left behind. Wow. Um, so I had those kinds of pressures growing up. Wow. Um, in home, my parents expected me to stay true to my Mexican roots and not adapt any of the American values. Uh, but in school, my cultural upbringing was hardly ever acknowledged and really never validated. Mm -hmm. Um, so because of my desire to be connected to my parents and make them proud like a young Mexican woman does, I did exactly that. I stayed away from holding any um, real relationships with people of other ethnicities and I avoided interactions with people outside my own at all costs. I was very proud of being a Mexican woman and embraced all of the cultures and the customs uh, even the unhealthy ones. And it actually wasn't until college that with hesitancy, I started dating someone who was white. Um, and just for the record, it wasn't Kevin. Uh, <laughs> 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 and I say that because um, a part of my testimony is that <laughs> Um, he actually started um, constantly criticizing everything that my family did and our ways of doing things. And I wasn't very grounded in myself at the time. And so I started to believe that because I got exposed to this American way of doing things, and my family was the only one that didn't do things, then I must have been born into the wrong race. It wasn't ethnicity at the time, it was race. Um, Right. And so my family actually um, started feeling really hurt by me because I started abandoning my roots and started assimilating to American culture through this relationship. And so um, after a much needed breakup and uh, going through a really rough time with my family, um, God revealed himself to me and that's when I became a believer. Wow. Amen. Amen. And so I, I, I started reading the Bible more out of desperation. I felt really alone. I didn't have my family. I was going over a really, I was going through a really tough breakup. And, um, but still God was just reminded me of his peace. And so as I continued to dive deeper into the Bible, um, I was just really thirsty for God. So um, a year after becoming a believer, I um, decided to do the Pink House because I wanted to learn more about God's Word. Um, and it was actually in the Pink House that valued the gift of ethnic diversity and in my involvement in the neighborhood with the uh, Latino community that I started seeing um, my ethnicity in a different lens. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was that year that I really felt God just embracing me and telling me, Mija, te quiero. Mm. Come on. Um, your, your ethnicity is not, it's not separate from me, and you are not a mistake. Mm. That's right. I made you a, an Amer a Mexican woman born in America, and it is beautiful. Yeah. And furthermore, besides that, he told me, and I plan to use your upbringing your cultural upbringing. I plan to use your cultural upbringing for my glory. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 Um, it was also in that year that I um, went through a lot of healing and reconciling through, for, towards a lot of um, prejudice and racism that I had towards other cultures. And actually, when we were praying here in the circle, I thought about that and I thought, like, gosh, this is. This is what I've been missing out on. Wow. Like just so much diversity within that circle and how glorifying it is to God. Yeah. Um, and so it was also in that year where I really started to understand that in every single ethnic group, God has instilled some of his beautiful qualities yeah. in them. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And he wants us to celebrate them and acknowledge that ethnic diversity. Um, and it was also that year that I also began to understand, it was almost a little frame because I also began to understand that 
within that beauty, there was also going to be complexity because culture is shaped by human beings and human beings are broken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But even within that, I felt the confidence that God would help us navigate those complexities because ultimately, yeah. ethnicity is from Him yeah. and ethnicity is good because yeah. it is His gift to us. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So it was in this very neighborhood that God has called on ramps to. Amen. That, um, he also used for my personal healing with my family, um, with my ethnic identity, and uh, with myself. And it was still the same. I, it took me a while to process this because I started realizing, like, what, I started thinking about what was the difference. I was still looking at the same culture, but what shift happened? Like, why, why did I all of a sudden see the <laughs> Mexican culture in this neighborhood? And that was good, but my family's culture, same culture, the food, the parties, um, mm. the little emphasis on time structure, it was all the same. Um, but the difference was that I started, I stopped first looking at my ethnicity through a society lens, through a mm. race lens, and instead started looking at it through an, an ethnic lens lens through God's gift of ethnicity yeah. to us. Yeah. Yeah. So when I started engaging with the indigenous community of the neighborhood, um, my ethnicity started to become very connected um, to, to my mission and in understanding the personal effects that immigration has for so many people in this community. The dominant narrative tells us that immigrants are criminals and that they are stealing jobs and living off a system without contributing to society, to society by paying taxes. Mm -hmm. And I will still stand here and say today that um, I don't, I'm not naive enough to believe that there are not immigrants, undocumented immigrants that are doing that, right? Just like there are citizens that are committing crimes, yeah. there are also undocumented individuals that are committing crimes. But what this neighborhood has shown me was that that is not the majority. Yeah. And that there is a different narrative that is not being told. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. So in this, in this neighborhood, um, I started learning a little more. And so um, we have about 6,000 residents in the Lowell community. About 2,200 of them are undocumented. But what I started to see with my involvement with them was that whether they knew it or not, they were passionately seeking God's kingdom. Wow. They wow. are involved in um, activities going on throughout the neighborhood. They have a desire to learn Spanish, so they're doing conversational English classes on a weekly basis. Um, they are heavily involved in activities that we do in Lowell, such as water days. They come out as volunteers. They cook some amazing meals for some of the, for the teachers at appreciation lunch. Homemade tortillas, chile, everything mm, that you on. can imagine. <laughs> bringing their culture to bring glory to God yeah. and for this neighborhood. Yeah, um, they are also meeting with city representatives to talk about issues that are affecting their community. And even in times that are difficult, they rally together. Um, uh, last year, there was a mom that passed away in a car crash. Uh, she was a mother of three. And within the span of two days, I get five phone calls from five different moms telling me about fundraisers that they're going to have for this mom. And some of those moms didn't even know the mother that had passed away. Um, and that is just how powerful the unity is yeah. in this community. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, also, on a weekly basis, they are meeting with a Spanish-speaking Bible study to dive deeper into God's Come Word. On. Come on. Uh, so they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah. Amen. So it was in the Lowell neighborhood that I realized that my view of undocumented and immigrants were, was very skewed. And it was very tainted by the media. Um, but even so, within all that beauty that I noticed, there was still, there was only so far that undocumented individuals could get in trying to better their lives. Uh, for example, if a family was having trouble with their, with their landlord, which in, in our neighborhood, I don't know you guys know, we call them slumlords. Um, <laughs> They cannot go to a certain organization to ask for help because that organization requires a social security number. So they have to be on their own for that. My friend Anna, she lives in the neighborhood, very involved parent. She has really high, really bad diabetes. And so she can't get any form of health care. So she has to go and get um, diabetes pills from her neighbor. 
Um, I actually gave a ride um, to one of my neighbors once. She was going, and it was when I first joined the Pink House before I learned about immigration a lot. And um, she was going to an attorney. She was telling me on the way that she was going to pay $7,000 because this attorney was going to help her um, become a resident. And um, that's, that was a scam. And it, and, and it hurts me. Every time I see her, I still feel the shame and embarrassment. Like, I know I need to get over it, but it was still that feeling of like, gosh, like if I knew then what I knew now, I could have prevented her from being scammed. Um, I didn't even know that at the time that um, individuals that were undocumented couldn't get driver's license. And so when I started seeing the basic privileges that I had, um, even just for the necessities of everyday life, it started making me feel really uncomfortable and wanted to know why there were certain systemic barriers set in place that prevented individuals and robbed them of the dignity of being contributing members to their society. With something as simple as having the legal way of transporting themselves to a job. Uh, so I committed to learn more about immigration. And so in the United States, there are 11 million individuals that are undocumented. In California alone, there are 2.6 million. That means that we almost have, almost have 25% of the undocumented uh, population living in our state. And from the layperson to the policymaker, people are all across the spectrum on this issue because it is, because it is very misunderstood and very controversial. Um, people are, you know, far rights are saying no, no borders, no matter how many people die trying to get in, people on the, or close the borders. People on the far left are saying open up the borders, let's not have any immigration policy. Um, and there are very valid concerns for national security job placement, and the scarcity of economic and health resources. And for us as Christians, sometimes we are very perplexed by the issue because we have a genuine desire to be image bearers of God's love towards others. Yeah. But the Bible also tells us to obey the law of the land. Yeah. Mm. But we have to ask ourselves, what happens when the law of the land does not align with God's narrative and his biblical principles? Mm -hmm. As Christians... We have to understand that when we take a law made by man as ultimate, we are giving up our moral discernment and our biblical just judgment. Say that again. Should I? Yeah. Yes. Are you being serious? Yes. Okay. <laughs> as Christians, when we take a man-made law as ultimate, we are giving up our moral judgment and our biblical judgment as well. So with, with what we do with our everyday lives, we must first turn to scripture yeah. to see what scripture tells us yeah. in guiding our lives. Amen. That's good. Amen. That's good. Um, so I know I've been throwing around these terms and I want to clarify them for you guys really quick if this conversation is new for you. Um, we, it's, I think it's more common for us to hear the term illegal immigrants. And, but we're really trying to stay away from that because it puts such a negative yeah. stereotype on individuals that have come here for various reasons. So undocumented. And for the purpose of this talk, I will use the word undocumented, although I hate to label the people that I have grown to love so much and limit them to just being undocumented. Yeah. Um, legal permanent resident. So when you come to this country without papers and you are, undocu you are undocumented, before even being able to apply for citizenship, you have to um, apply for legal permanent residency. Uh, and then, five years after you've received that, then you can apply for citizenship. So legal permanent residency limits you to certain things. Like you can't vote if you're a legal permanent resident. You can vote if you're a citizen. Mm. So I just wanted to clarify those terms before we get started. So scriptures, consistent and true to see what God says about the immigrant. I, um, when I first started learning about immigration, I loved how people talked about looking at the lens, looking at the Bible through the lens of immigration and seeing how much of God's glory has been used through this concept of people moving from one place to another. It's just changing the narrative of how we think of things. So um, Phil, can you read this out loud for me? Sure. Genesis 12, chapters one or verses one through three. 
leave your country, leave your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. To me, that is so beautiful because we see that the beginning of Abraham's story is is dominated by immigration. And because he did that, wow. God said, all the people of the earth will be blessed. Mm. Mm. Abraham's great-grandson, Joseph, was sold into slavery by his own brothers. Um, slavery is another form of immigration, human trafficking. Yet, he became the king of Egypt's great advisor, using that position to save his people. If we look at um, the Bible, we continue to see different people throughout the Bible. We have Nehemiah, we have Ruth, David, and many more. And we see them continuing to move from one place to another. And of course we have Jesus. Mary and, Mary and Joseph fled to escape King Herod. Yeah. Yeah. So he immigrated in the womb. I think it's also mm. good to note that he also immigrated from heaven yeah. to earth. Right? Yeah. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Uh, so when <laughs> Philip good. went to go tell Nathaniel about um, Jesus, Nathaniel replied, Nazareth? What good can come from Nazareth? Come on. And again, the negative stereotype that immigrants have nothing good to contribute to our society, right? Uh, Jesus was not only an immigrant, but he constantly took in the outsider, both socially and geographically. We see him interacting with tax collectors, and we mm -hmm. see him interacting with the Samaritan woman. Amen. Um, now, if we look at, so that was more of the, I guess, like, the implicit way of how God is using immigration, right? It's not really in our faces. You have to really look at it through that lens to be able to see it. But when we actually look at scriptures, we still see that God has specific mandates for us in our treatment for the immigrant. Yes. You want to go to the next slide? Um, Peter, you want to read that for me? Yeah. Thank you. Leviticus 19, 33 to 34. When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner resides among you. you must be treated as you're not your native born. Love them as yourself, for mm -hmm. you were foreigners in Egypt. Mm -hmm. I am the Lord your God. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I want you guys to get in groups of two or three and talk about your family's immigrant story. Were you always from the Central Valley? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I just realized that uh, I just put their name to your face. Artie, no, Carol's been talking to me yeah, about, yeah. about uh, doing the DBS. Yes. yes, oh yes, one of these. Yes. We need to talk afterwards. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys. I know I really didn't give you guys much time. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody willing to share? Anybody want to share a little bit with them? Yeah, I didn't realize how much my dad's side of the family. So my grandparents are from Arkansas. And 
and then they so then I thought, well, my dad was born in Fresno, but then I forgot the part where a large a lot of his siblings were born in Washington, and then they came down to Sanger. So I forgot about like that. So much movement. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I forgot about that. One more person. We randomly picked this group, and our roots are mostly from Ohio. Wow! wow. Yeah. You did it! Yeah. 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 Cousins. <laughs> so, um, I think it's really easy for us to live in the present and forget our history, right? And to see how much of our, if we are not indigenous Native Americans, that we are definitely impacted by by the influence of immigration here. Um, so Matthew, another one. Um, yeah, sure. Matthew 25, 35 and 36. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after, after me. And I was in prison and you came to visit me. So in this passage, um, we see that Jesus, we know that Jesus had a commitment to the marginalized and the oppressed. But in this passage, he purposely connects himself with the immigrant. Um, I'm gonna, I have another handout at the end that you guys can dive deeper into other passages if you just want to learn more about it. Um, there are over 80 passages in, in, uh, verses in scripture that talks about God's heart for the immigrant. Um, so after we lay the biblical foundation, that is really when we begin to dive a little deeper, when we are grounded in God's truth. Um, so with something that I hear a lot is illegal immigrants came here by their own choice and they should just go back to where they came from. And they don't see the influences that are behind people's decisions in coming into this country. And we'll look at it a little bit um, throughout our history and today. But there are what are called push and pull factors. Hmm. Push is when they are pushed out of their own country, either because of poverty, war, or persecution. Pulled is when the United States itself is influencing people to come to our country hmm. by the promises of job, freedom, and family reun reunification. Hmm. Go ahead, Phil. Um, so just to look at a little bit of our American history, just to see the different waves of immigration. Um, we know that wow. American independence huh. starts off wow. from people coming into another people's territory, Come on. right? Um, can somebody over here on this side read this passage for me, uh, this quote? It's from Mark Ooh. Charles. He's a Native American that is really involved in, uh, with just, uh, just bringing more acknowledgement towards um, the, how we have forgotten the Native American community in our history. Um, yes, this whole immigration conversation is solely about one generation of illegal immigrants suppressing another generation of illegal immigrants. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's deep. Yeah. That's so deep. Um, go ahead. So all, well, I'm going to skip a little bit of this, but I just want to give you a really quick overview. There are various waves of immigration through our American history, and with each of these waves, we see America trying to dis uh, basing whether or not they welcome the immigrants based on what's going to be good for our country. Um, for example, in the gold rush and the Pacific Railroad. Um, the Pacific Railroad was completed in 1869. So during this time, there was an influx of Chinese men that came yeah. to work in our country. And they were welcomed only until the jobs became scarce. Afterwards, there were um, theories coming out that the Chinese were racially inferior to Americans. So they came out with the Chinese Exclusionary Act in 1882, and they made it legal to prohibit Chinese from coming into our country. Hmm. Got removed after a while, but that's just to, that's just to show you the anti-immigration sentiment based on race. Um, of the Bracero program. During World War II, there was a shortage of jobs, and so the United States created um, a tr uh, sort of like a program with Mexico to bring in workers during that time. <coughs> during that time, workers came in, there were about 4.6 4. million visas granted to Mexican workers to come. And that's a lot of a lot of those workers actually overstayed their visas because they knew that 
going back home hmm. meant poverty and meant famine for their families. Um, so I think history, I wanted to cover a little bit, of, we don't have too much time to go into the American history part of it, hmm. but I think it's really important for us to see that with that last slide that you saw, there was also, can you go back to it really quick, Phil? There was European immigration as well, and still the same thing. They were, they, they, they were welcomed with prejudice in this country. And I point that out just to show that this is not a Latino issue. Immigration is not a Latino yeah. issue. Yep, that's right. um, my, my pastor, um, Kreiner from St. Rest, I love the way he talks about it because he says, this is not a brown issue, this is a red issue. It is a human blood issue. Mm. We see with history that it affects people from all over the world yeah. as it does, as it did now and it does today. Yeah. And also, because we see this and we realize that so much of our racial history in America is so tied into the immigration history as well. Uh, and what I mean by that is that we have bought into this lie. Um, we bought into this lie that um, that the immigrant is the enemy, when in reality, um, this immigration issue is all about a deep-seated racism in our country. Mm. Mm. And so there's also other things that influence uh, the way that we view immigrants, right? Like I talked about it a little bit at the beginning. There's all these um, misconceptions that people believe, that they don't pay taxes, um, they're draining our economy. And I just want to touch a little bit on that. Um, they don't pay taxes. When you go to the store, are you asked for a social security number? <laughs> no. Um, do, we, do you guys rent or own a home? Right. You're paying property taxes through that. USA doesn't ask people if they're undocumented, and they do not say, okay, you're undocumented, you don't have to pay taxes. We all pay taxes, and um, the property taxes that you pay through um, paying rent and owning a home go into our education system. So undocumented individuals are paying into that system. Also, uh, three out of four undocumented individuals are working under a false social security number. And what that means is that because they don't have any other ways, they have to provide for their families, so they're working under a false social security number. Um, when they get their pay stubs, they get money taken out, but that their number is never connected to their name. So what happens at, when they retire? They're, they're never going to get that money back. It goes yeah. into a fund that is going to benefit all of us. Um, the Social Security Administration um, announced that in 2007, $12 billion were contributed into the Social Security, Social Security um, from false Social Security numbers. Wow. On an annual basis, it ranges from 6 to $7 billion. Wow. Yeah. So they do pay taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes they don't qualify for some of the benefits that those taxes are um, going into. Wow. Uh, another thing is, why don't they come in the legal way? I'll touch this briefly. But let me show you what the legal way looks like today. We are living under the Immigration Reform Bill of 1964. Wow. There are four basic categories to get into the uh, United States. And I'll read them to you really quick. Family-based immigration, employer-based immigration, hum humanitarian immigration, and diversity lottery. So. I don't know if you guys can read that, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, the, the United States places quotas on how many individuals can come from a certain country. So, for people that are overrepresented already in this country, that means that they're having to wait sometimes up to 50 years to be able to go through this legal way. Yeah. Um, Employer-based immigration. That is if employers can't find adequate workers in this in, in this country, they can request to bring people in. 140,000 visas per year are allowed under this category, but only 5,000 are allowed under the areas of construction, manufacturing, agriculture, and hospitality. Not under each of those, under all four of those together. Wow. Mm -hmm. And we are a consumer-driven economy. Yes. 
With one hand, we are telling them to come because we require them for the, for the standard of living that, that unit, the USA has created. But with the other hand, we're telling them to go away because yeah. we don't want them. Wow. Uh, another reason why this system is broken is because in 1995, they came out with what is, what is called the bar. So what the bar tells you is that if you've been here illegally for more than one year, you have to go back to your home country for 10 years mm -hmm. before being able to apply, not get accepted, apply for this process. Wow. So what happens when kids were brought here, kids are brought here by the parents and now they're adults. They're having to pay for their parents' decisions. Wow. Um, so that is why the broken system today does not work for the 11 million individuals that are living in this country. If they would, they could, trust me. They would do things the legal way. Uh, go ahead, Phil, to the next stage. Okay, so um, today, people are speaking out, saying that the current immigration system is an oppression to human dignity. Um, the church community, from the most conservatives to the most liberals, are actually saying that they are wanting a comprehensive immigration reform that is based on biblical principles. The principles of being made in God's image, the principles of justice and compassion for all, and the principles of dignity for individuals. Um, the church has actually been really influential in pushing for an immigration reform to get the government to actually acknowledge that they need to move forward on this. Uh, so, the, um, and so the, the government has now created, under the House of Representatives last year, they came out with this bill for a comprehensive immigration reform that would consider both national security and human dignity for all with a pathway to citizenship for people. Mm -hmm. So that got passed last year, so that is a victory. Amen. However, um, for a bill to become a law, it has to go through both houses. So now it's waiting in the Senate. The Senate has said that they are not going to accept this bill that the House proposed. Um, mainly because the Senate is um, made up of majority Republicans, although there has been some Republican support for this bill. So right now we are stalled. Uh, they do not want to move forward with it, and if it's not because of the community and the way that the church has gotten involved in this issue, it wouldn't continue to move forward. So that's where we're at right now. And um, per year, there are 400,000 individuals that are getting deported under, um, under the administration of Obama right now. So um, in Fresno County, one out of every five kids has a parent that is un un undocumented. So what that means is that because of the current state of deportation, for many of those one in five kids, they're actually getting separated from their families. And we know that separation of families is not a line in the kingdom of God. So that's sort of where we're at right now. There have been some wins. Um, there's a lot of support for immigration reform, bipartisan, both by Republicans and Democrats. But um, it needs to continue being pushed forward um, before um, Obama can sign it. And right now, that's where the difficulty is, is that the... The Senate does not want to accept this bill, and they want to come out with a more harsh bill that's going to put a really big emphasis on border patrol. Mm -hmm. um, and I will, for, for the record, just say that this is not going to just give freedom to everybody that's undocumented to, to become um, legal permanent residents. If they have a criminal record, they do not qualify. So that is being taken under consideration. Um, I understand that this is a very complex issue, and for us, we might be in different places with um, how we feel about it. Um, but if that's where you're at, I really encourage you guys to just um, sit in the Word and just let God, let God be your voice in this. Um, not myself, not others, but let God be your voice in this. Um, and let us be a church that treats our neighbors yeah. as created in the image of God yeah. and with yeah. the dignity yeah. and compassion that he has given us as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and if anything, just I really just encourage you guys to just build relationships here in this neighborhood. Um, it's just been an absolute joy to see how much, how much love undocumented individuals have in this community. And it's changed the way that I've looked at the undocumented or the illegal resident. So, yeah, thank you guys. Thank you, Adi.
invite um, Katie and Tiffany up, and then um, we have some instructions on, okay, what's next? We heard all this surprising, shocking, hard, good information. Okay, now what? We sit here and do what? Um, so there will be some explanation as to what the next step will be. As a church, how do we impact now? Um, our neighbors. These are people that we live with. Like We love our neighbors and we live with them and we love them and we watch their kids and they watch our kids and we, I mean, these are our neighbors. These are our friends, our family. So what do we do? Um, but first, just continuing with the theme of being reconciled to ourselves through our ethnicity, Tiffany and KD want to respond in a beautiful way, a beautiful expression of poetry. So we'll hear from you. Um, did you want us to tell us your process or just you know, whatever you want? Process is good. Process? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm Tiffany. Um, I've been writing poetry for a long time, um, but me and Katie have different, you know, different ways of writing. We have different styles, and um, we all we both agree like this is kind of different, you know, difficult for us because usually we just go in our dark place and, and the feelings come and we just write, with, you know, what God puts on our heart. But we had to come together and write specifically about the scripture, and we just broke it down, and this is what. God, you know, led us to write, and Katie's amazing and mm -hmm. very talented, and we just got together and did this. So, hope you guys like it. Okay. I try to memorize this, but I don't know. <laughs> it's I, might, I might have to look at the notes. Okay. <clears throat> For in him we live, like flowers among the countryside, whether yellow, pink, or blue. We are all grown for the same purpose, all connected to the same root. Mm -hmm. He knew us before we sprouted and before our first petal. Mm -hmm. Yet we seem to think it's the origin of our outside that earns us our metal. Mm -hmm. wow. It was beforehand that he decided when we should rise and when we should fall. But we act as if it's our pigmentation that determines whether we stay short or grow tall. Okay. Wow. Mm -hmm. He built the house. We painted the walls, divided he made, but united us all. Fearfully made, powerful and unique. We stand in awe because it's in him that we seek. So that we might see one another as assets, especially as your pieces of a puzzle. Connecting to find our creator because our hunger cannot be buzzed. For in him we, we are alive and we are heirs of the king. As some of the poets have once said, we, we are his offspring. offspring. Wow. Some of y'all like, don't they snap it? I uh, listen. So, so thank you, Katie. And thank you for sharing. Uh, let me. Uh, we're, we're closing here. And let me just say this. Um, so, why Ariana Martinez? Well, first of all, I don't know anybody who tells this story, and I've heard many people tell it in their own way. But I don't know anybody that tells it better than Ariana. Yeah. And yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. so so, first of all, she tells the story so well, and so rightly, and so honorably. Yeah. Yeah. Secondly, uh, she lives in this neighborhood. Yeah. Okay? So it makes sense for our mission as a church to have Ariana come share this story. Thirdly, as she said, look, half of the population in the Lowell neighborhood okay, is Latino. Roughly 2,000 of the Latino residents in this neighborhood are undocumented. That's the estimate. Roughly half of the state's population is Latino, right? Almost half of our country, right, is now ethnic minority, right? Okay. So. So this is a, a critical issue for the church to become engaged in. Yeah. It would be critical if 
if there were one undocumented resident in our country. That's right. Okay? Yeah. But it's hugely critical for the church to become engaged in this conversation because there is a giant number of undocumented residents, not just in our country, not just in our state, but in our neighborhood. Okay? So we have to become engaged. You have to be able to connect with this story that Ariana shared uh, with us tonight. Yes? Let's talk about politics. This is not a political conversation. This is an image of God conversation. Yeah. This is a rec this is a gospel of reconciliation conversation. This is a love God, love our neighbors conversation. Okay? This is why as we live this out, right? As we live as followers of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus is good news to our world. It's not just good news to citizens of our country. It's good news to the entire world. Right? Undocumented or citizens. It would be true if we were in another country. It is true here. The gospel of Jesus Christ is good news to our entire world. So what does that look like? Well, it means that we live differently. It means that we love differently. It means that we don't buy in to the narratives that have been driving our world and driving our society that says all the things that Ariana said that simply, plainly, are not true. Okay? So I'm just going to tell you that everything on the news is not true. <laughs> it's not. It's not. You know how you know? What? Watch one news report and then watch another one and watch how they differ. If they're both true, I don't know. I don't know how that works. Okay? I'm just saying that there are different perspectives in our world, right? And as Ariane said so well, we go to Scripture. We say, God, how do we live as followers of you in this world? Okay? And Ariana laid a great foundation for that. Okay? And so uh, I don't want you to get caught up in politics, but I do want you to become engaged in the healing of our world. Okay? And one of the ways, one of the ways in which that looks is that you do ultimately legislation is in the Senate right now. And you've got to decide as a follower of Jesus, you decide. I'm not telling you what to think about this. Okay, Ariana just presented the facts. You need to decide how you feel about that legislation. Are you in support of it? Are you against it? You figure it out. Okay? But I encourage you, alright, to communicate what you think about it. Okay? To your representatives in the Senate. Yes? To your senators. Okay? So you figure that out. Beyond that, if you don't want to get involved in that because you don't feel called to that, you feel like, ah, I'm not going to exercise my voice, or I'm just totally confused, or for whatever reason you decide that you don't want to exercise your right to vote, okay? And for those of you, uh, let me just say that. And there are so many other ways. Okay, Ariana has prepared for us tonight these wonderful prayers for our neighborhood and for families who are undocumented or families of undocumented family members, okay? And so there's that. And then sort of, I'm going in, in strange order here, but also just praying for yourself. All right? What I love about what Ariana said is this. Our ethnic heritage matters. Yeah. It is good because it is from God. Yeah. And so her journey. Why did we talk about, why did we choose the conversation about immigration, immigration reform? We chose it because Ariana's journey mm -hmm. of being reconciled to herself through her ethnicity, is a journey that is intimately tied and connected to the story of the immigrant here in this country, in this valley, and in this city. That's why. And her story is our story. And your story is our story. That's what it means to be part of the church, is that we embrace fully who you are. We don't say to Ariana, Ariana, love you, sister, okay? But, um, you know, whatever you care about, we don't care about that stuff. That's not the church. Okay? What you care about, who you are, your pain is our pain. Your celebrations are our celebrations. What you're passionate about, we are passionate about. We love not part of you, we love all of you. Okay? And so we also love your ethnic heritage. Why? Because it's from God. And you love my ethnic heritage. So wherever you are from, whatever your ethnic heritage is, whatever your culture is, whatever you believe, whatever, whatever, wherever you fall in the line, politically left, politically right, it doesn't matter. We, we welcome all of you 
and you are part of this church. It's what it means. We embrace you fully. And so now, you're right. Kim said it earlier. We start this race in different places. And Kim said, man, I'm just going to focus on running this race as fast as I can. I'm running my race. I'm focused on my race. <laughs> you know, she's right about that. But you know what else? Being a follower of Jesus means that we don't just focus on running our race. We actually focus on everyone else's race also. We care about each other's race. We care where you start the race. We care if you trip and fall in the middle of the race. We care about this entire race because this is what it looks like to be the answer to the prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Someone once said, we are the answer to our own prayer. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Amen. Yeah. 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 And so yes, we run our own race, but, but we don't run it facing forward. We sort of face it with our head on the swivel. Mm -hmm. Kind Come of on. seeing how everyone else is doing. Mm -hmm. When you stumble, I stop. And I pick you up. Mm -hmm. And when you cross the finish line, I celebrate right alongside. Because yeah. that's what it is. But that's not how our world is, is it? That's not how society is, is it? It's sort of best. It's, it's sort, of, sort of every man and every woman for themselves. Mm -hmm. Survival of the fittest. The strongest survive. But that's not good news, is it? That's not God's kingdom, is it? And so we live differently. That's what this is about tonight. Is leaning into that reality. And the realities of our race and ethnicity in our world. And the challenge that it presents to the body of Christ. To live in this world as witnesses of God's kingdom. Let me pray for us as we leave. There is again, as Ariana said... I invite you, I think, you know, frankly, you could take, if you were going to pray those prayers, I invite you to take them home with you. They're like few, they're only a few copies, okay? Take a picture of it with your phone, okay? Take it home with you if you like, but, but if you're going to do that, pray, okay? If you're going to pray for your neighborhood, for our neighborhood, take it home with you. There's a sheet in back, I think, as well, right, Ariana? Uh, yes, that has the scriptures. Where is that? Back there somewhere, Okay. There's a sheet in back that you can take home to read more scripture around the topic of immigration in the Bible. And then what's that in the back left? Um, that's, uh, there's also a website that you guys can go and um, if you really wanted to send a message to your congressman and stuff like that. So there's we have the number. Is that awesome? Okay. Wherever you stand on the issue, like Phil said. Good. Thank you. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for this night. God, I thank you for the way in which you're changing our idea about what it means to live for you. God, we thank you for this community of people that understand, Father, that life with you is not just about me. It's about us. And that, God, as we live as an us and not just a me or an I, that, God, that is good news to our world because people don't suffer the way they're suffering now. People don't feel alone the way they feel alone now. People don't feel isolated the way they feel isolated now because we are our arms are linked together. They're locked together. And God, our arms are locked together with everyone in this room. And they're also locked together with every undocumented resident in this neighborhood, city, and beyond. God, we pray for families pray for individuals. We pray for communities. We pray most of all, God, that your kingdom would come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, we love you and we thank you tonight. Bless Ariana. Thank you for her. Thank you for her life, her story, her journey. Continue, God, to propel her into places. Father, where she would share this story with audiences, God, who have never heard this story. Yeah. <laughs> God, take her into those spaces and places, God, that she may shape the thinking and the hearts yes. of people who are calloused and hard and closed off because of stories they've been told that simply are not true. God, we give you glory now.
for all you've done tonight in this very place. Thank you for this food which has been prepared for us to enjoy together. We celebrate one another tonight. We celebrate ourselves tonight and our own ethnic heritages, wherever they are. We celebrate them because they are good, because they are from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good night.